Welcome to this seminar on art and digital technology in a time of crisis. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Bohr Institute uh, at NEY Galway. And this is part of a series uh, that we've done in the Bohr Institute uh, in our COVID-19 response. We've had six previous sessions since we began the series on April 2nd. And recordings of the previous ones are available on the Moore Institute website and on our YouTube channel. I'm very grateful to Al Putnam for organizing and chairing this session. And I'd now like to hand over to you. Thanks, Al. Hi, Dan. Thank you. And thank you for offering the platform for us to present on this topic. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to start this session with a moment of silence in support and solidarity of Black people and communities and to acknowledge the injustices and systemic violence they are experiencing in the United States and Ireland, which includes the direct provision system. And also, as we're beginning, I have been seeing online and on social media that there have been quite a number of books going around to help people be educated and resources regarding these injustices. And I just wanted to add a few to this list in relation to racial inequality, um, particularly in relation to our topic that we're going to be discussing today. So uh, their titles are just up here. Um, one is Rua Benjamin's uh, Raced After Technology. Another is Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression. And these texts regard the, perp the perpetuation of inequality and injustice through technology. And then also in regards to blackness and the afterlife of slavery and art and literature, just uh, Christina Sharp's In the Wake. So the thinking behind putting together this panel is in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated public health restrictions, such as social distancing, which has meant the closure of many spaces, cultural spaces, galleries, theaters, and cancellations of festivals around the world. And many creative practi practitioners and other workers in the creative and culture industries have been looking towards online platforms as suitable solutions to connect with audiences and to continue producing work in this wave of techno solutionism. And that includes the Irish Arts Council and Culture Ireland with the proposal to create work for Facebook, which did receive a great deal of criticism from the Irish arts community as, it, as a severely insufficient means of supporting the culture industries. Um, it soon became apparent that it would not be just a simple transition from presenting work within our different lope spaces and then just going online. Um, meaning a lot of people needed to re-envision projects or delay them indefinitely. And it's also clear that not all creative work translates well onto digital platforms and a uniform strategy is not appropriate. So even within this, there are artists who are utilizing these platforms in new and exciting ways, uh, many of whom have been already working with digital technologies and are familiar with their affordances and their material limitations. And we're gonna hear from some of these individuals today. So um, I'm just gonna give a little background on each of the speakers in order of their presentation. So uh, the first is Dr. Mairead Nacron, who is a theater maker and academic based in Galway. She is co-director of the bilingual company Moonfish Theater and has had an individual practice as a, a digital theater maker. She was appointed Druid Theater Artist in Residence in NUI Galway in 2019 and currently lectures in ensemble theater producing and arts management. In her individual practice, Mairead has worked with and studied the use of body-centric technologies, particularly mobile technologies, to create immersive and interactive works that place the audience member at the center of the experience. Her PhD focused on how mobile digital technologies can be used to tap into and transform audience members' sensory embodied experiences in ways that engender empathy and critical reflection. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Leonie Bradbury who is joining us from Emerson College in Boston. 
She is the Foster Chair of Contemporary Art Theory and Practice and Curator in Residence at Emerson College in Boston. She teaches seminars in curating contemporary art as well as new courses on contemporary art and critical discourse. She directs Emerson's platform for visual art, Emerson Contemporary, that is focused on presenting and commissioning new media art, performance art, and emerging creative technologies within a socio-political context. She curates exhibitions for several spaces on campus, including the Media Art Gallery, and organizes public art events in the city of Boston. Dr. Bradbury is a respected authority on both creative and scholarly aspects of contemporary art. She has more than 20 years experience in public programming, developing new work, creating compelling and innovative exhibitions and promoting artists as thought leaders. Most recently, she served as Director of Art and Creative Initiatives at Hub Week, which is an innovation festival showcasing the intersections of art, science and technology. So uh, next we have is Dr. Connor McGargle, who is an artist and researcher that lectures in fine art at TU Dublin School of Creative Arts and is a fellow of the Graduate School of Creative Arts and Media or GradCam. His practice is characterized by urban interventions mediated through digital technologies and data-driven explorations of network social practices. His projects include durational walking performances, large-scale outdoor projections, smartphone apps, and generative video installations. His research examines the implications of pervasive network devices and computational processes through the lens of critical art practice. His work is rooted in a historical analysis of the intersections of art and technology, demonstrating how contemporary and historical practices develop new readings and critical understandings of network technologies and emergent user practices. His work has been widely presented at exhibitions and conferences worldwide, including the Venice Biennale, the Centre Pompidou Paris, the Saint-Étienne Biennial, SIGGRAPH, um, EVA International, the Science Gallery, and more. And our final presenter today is Professor Noel Fitzpatrick, who is Professor of Philosophy and Aesthetics and the Dean of GradCam. He is the Head of Learning and Research Development at the College of Arts and Tourism at TU Dublin. He is a leading member of the European Artistic Research Network, SHARE, and the European Society of Aesthetics. Professor Fitzpatrick is a member of Ars Industrialis, which was founded by philosopher Bernard Stiegler and a founding member of the Digital Studies Network at the L'Institut de Recherche et Innovation and at the Centre Pompidou Centre. So Professor Fitzpatrick has been awarded research funding from the Irish Research Council and has been the Marie Curie Research Fellow, currently coordinator of the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange Real Smart Cities Project. And um, he's presented and published widely in contemporary theater studies, philosophy, philosophy of art, philosophy of science and technology, educational research, and computer mediated discourse analysis. And I also wanted to point out that we're broadcasting live on Flirt AM, or Flirt FM today, not AM. So we're also on the radio. Hello out there in Radio Land. Um, so if I could just pass it on to Marit now. Thanks very much, Elle, and hello, everybody. Um, I thought I'd just begin by uh, speaking a little bit about my own arts practice and uh, the ways in which the current crisis has affected it and maybe the possibilities and challenges that it has revealed. Um, so as Elle mentioned, I have a theatre company that works, I suppose now you'd call it in the old fashioned way of presenting work on stage. Um, and we are an ensemble theatre company, we work with devised practice. And so a lot of our work is very intensively in the room, building the theatre performance from the ground up, um, involving a lot of um, movement based kind of exercises and um, a lot of kind of I suppose, close contact. And um, it's been very interesting. We had a, a tour booked um, for September, October, and um, the touring funding applications was cancelled, um, as I'm sure you know. So uh, that particular aspect, I suppose, of my practice is still very much in flux. And um, we are actually on the point of having a conversation amongst our uh, company members in terms of how we kind of respond to the current crisis and where we kind of see our practice going. I think we're very lucky in the sense that we have a lot of people in the ensemble who um, have a lot of skills, skills that can be kind of quickly used to kind of maybe reconfigure our work 
towards the digital um, filmmaking skills in particular. But I think something that uh, we have always strongly believed in our practice because we create devised work um, often devised from literature. And that has meant that we always um, think a lot about a, the translation from one medium to another and what is going on in that translation and how you need to respect, I suppose, the, um, the opportunities and also the parameters of different media. Um, and I think that is something that we'll be thinking through a lot when it comes to thinking about our work and how it translates to the digital medium, especially maybe the screen-based medium. Um, and it's, it's something that I think is, has, needs to be thought about a lot because as Elle was kind of saying, um, some forms of, of um, art just don't work very well or don't translate immediately well to, to the screen uh, or to digital platforms. And so there is a real strong conversation required and almost another devising process and an ensemble process around how that work is created. So that's something that I think we'll be focusing on kind of building our skills in over the next while. Um, and then as Elle mentioned, I also have an individual practice as a digital theatre maker, mostly focusing on uh, work to do with mobile um, and pervasive technologies. And I have actually just finished um, a short work in progress uh, project as part of uh, the Interaction Festival through Goway Theatre Festival, um, which is an interesting project because it actually began, um, it was conceived four years, four years ago by myself and a number of other artists as a kind of a laboratory for digital practices for theatre and performance, uh, very much drawing on um, the, the, the work done by the Pervasive Media Studio over in Bristol in the UK and kind of being inspired by that idea of the lab process and of iterations of work um, and of people, uh, theatre artists and performers who maybe weren't very comfortable working with digital technologies having the chance to kind of progressively um, scale up their skills and work with people and understand the different languages that you need to be able to communicate uh, across a team of people with um, different types of live performance and digital perform digital coding uh, skills and engineering skills. Um, so that was originally a four-year uh, laboratory kind of proposal. Uh, it eventually ended up being a much, much shorter project. Um, but it was very interesting to be a part of and uh, it really did leave me with the sense that, um, as Elle was saying, the, the time it takes to really understand the medium that you're working with, uh, to understand it, I think, as artists, not just superficially in, the, in kind of, you know, pointing a camera at something and, and filming it and, and uh, figuring out how to disseminate it, but also understanding it to the point where you can really uh, critique it in your own practice and uh, be aware maybe of the different um, paths that that technology is maybe pushing you down. Um, because I think every, every form of digital technology, every form of technology, uh, every tool that we use has a certain way that it, um, a certain function and uh, a certain function that maybe it's, it's supposedly best at. Um, and often artists take that tool and do something completely different with it. But I think if you don't understand that tool and you don't understand how it works, um, the kind of the default is to use it to do what everybody else does with it um, or what everybody else presumes it's good at. And sometimes I think some of the most interesting innovations come when somebody com comes to a tool, understands what people think it's good at, but then um, take it in a completely different direction and maybe make us as an audience question why we use that tool or that technology in a particular way and what we're allowing um, ourselves to do and, and to perform um, by using that technology in a certain way. So I think that um, those would be kind of my thoughts at the moment around kind of my practice and where it's taken me over the last while. So I'll hand back to Elle now. Great. Thanks, Mairead. Um, Leone, if you want to jump in now. Hello, here we go. Hi everyone, my name is Leonie Bradbury and I would like to um, take one moment here before I talk about curating in the context of the coronavirus to also take this opportunity to denounce the senseless and brutal murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis while in police custody on May 25th, a little over a week ago. 
I also wish to acknowledge and denounce the systematic racism and racial discrimination that are pervasive in the US and the racial, social, and economic inequalities that are informing the mass protests that we're seeing across many cities in the US over the past eight days, including Boston, where my gallery is located. And lastly, I want to take this moment to protest the frequent and horrific acts of police brutality against people of color and the continued excessive use of force by the police in response to the protesters. It is shocking, despicable, and frankly inhumane. So we need action, and I myself am finding ways to help and be a part of a solution and to be more actively engaged. And if any of you are interested in finding ways to get involved, and I know we have an international audience here today, I'd like to briefly recommend the Obama Foundation website, which has many practical and inspirational advocacy resources for people to help create a more just and equitable world. So my gallery or our gallery, Emerson Contemporary, uh, the visual arts platform for Emerson College is an academic gallery space. Um, our main gallery, the Media Art Gallery, is located right in downtown on Boston Common in a very busy urban area. And we have been closed since March 15th because of regulations from the city and the state. And since then, we have responded in a variety of ways, which I'll briefly discuss with you today. So a guiding question for me as a curator has been to see if this could be an opportunity to reinvent and to experiment. So while um, the gallery was closing, I was in the midst of teaching a curating contemporary art class with a group of 15 students, undergrads, and they had just selected um, works of art by 13 local and emerging Boston artists. And seeing as the gallery space was closed, we had to quickly pivot and see how we could still make an exhibition when we no longer were able to have a physical space. So um, with incredible energy and ingenuity, um, several of the students in my class designed a virtual gallery space, which um, after I'm discussing several of our initiatives, I'll switch over to a screen share and I'll show you some of the images of that and a few other things. And they basically copied our physical gallery space and then installed the works that were um, curated for that space in this virtual space. Um, one of the interesting kind of challenges was is that of course the work was not selected with a digital environment in mind. So there are some works that worked better in that context than others. So and then secondly, in April, the Hollow Center in New York um, invited us to participate in a projection or a day of light um, art installation where I believe over 80 different organizations across the globe participated in um, installing light art in their spaces, um, whether that was projections or light on windows or, you know, it was a really broad range of artworks in conjunction with the International Day of Light, which was on May 16th. So I curated a project called Sending Light which was a digital window showcase that featured art from the Emerson community, students, faculty, alumni, and I'll show you a short clip of that as well. And then I also collaborated with a team of people at Emerson to put together something for commencement and our graduates because our commencement and graduation is postponed until an unknown future date. So we wanted to acknowledge their accomplishments and also um, take a moment to again acknowledge all of the essential workers and the people on the front line in the COVID crisis. So and that took the form of a really large scale projection on one of our iconic buildings um, also located on the Boston Common in Boston. And we, I commissioned work from an artist, Allison Tannenhaus, a local glitch artist, and she um, translated words of encouragement for our students into little um, digital gifts, which in the end ended up being 80 by 80 feet, so quite large. And I also um, collaborated with an organization, a design lab called Amplifier in Seattle, and they design um, social messaging campaigns and um, commissioned 60 different artists to design graphic responses to the COVID crisis. And we selected three of those artists to also showcase on the building. And then lastly, I am currently working with a variety of curators in the Boston area from 
academic arts organizations, from commercial galleries, independent curators, and we are putting together a virtual art fair called Area Code. And I will be um, curating an evening of digital art content to be um, projected and screened in a parking lot. So kind of creating an impromptu um, movie theater. So now I'll switch to sharing my screen. And here you can um, see the virtual gallery space that the students created. I will not be navigating through this space right now, but it's um, on a platform called Art Steps. And the show is called What's Next, Art for Tomorrow. And we've already had almost 500 people who visited the exhibition, which is probably what we would expect um, in if in our normal physical space, we usually have about 500 people who visit each exhibition in person, not counting um, our events, which obviously we're not able to do public events. And I'm also going to show you a brief clip of the gallery. So here you can see the gallery space and some footage of descending light installation. And we basically put rear projection screens and several monitors in our window spaces and people can drive by or walk by um, to see this artwork. And then lastly, um, here's the one Emerson project and this is the work by Allison Tannenhaus. And this is one of our academic buildings and also our um, big student dorm called the Little Building. You can kind of see bits of the park and how that work looks in the urban context. And yes, those are the projects that I wanted to share with you all today. And I look forward to talking more. Um, Connor, if you want to jump. Yep. Okay, uh, and again, I'd just like to thank Al for uh, inviting me here to, this afternoon, and it's, it's really great to to be part of this part of this conversation. Uh, so, uh, I wasn't going to talk so much about my own work, but just as kind of a general reflection about this this shift to making art online during the pandemic. Uh, and one of the just to begin, I think one of the things that has been interesting is that even though it has been chaotic every as we've moved everything online and I'm talking about as an artist and also as a teacher uh, we've discovered that most things actually to some degree actually work uh, and that's kind of both liberating and terrifying as the old certainties fall away uh, so what I want to really focus on is how is this question of how we make art online so I teach fine art uh, my specialty is new media and I come from a background in net art, so I'm kind of used to this area. Uh, even the term itself, new media, which is kind of my appointment, is this very anachronistic phrase, uh, but it's one that's still used and still resonates because in the art world, using computers to make art is still somehow new. Uh, because art, we believe, requires physical presence. Uh, and then with the shutdown of physical spaces, this is probably the longest period of time with no gallery exhibitions since the exhibition itself becomes this dominant form uh, sometime in the 19th century. Uh, so in the 1960s, uh, the situation is called for the suppression of art. They believe that for art to be fully realized, it needed to be indistinguishable from life and that the only way to do this was that the art world needed to be suppressed. Uh, so this is my first point. Uh, what, happen, what happens to art when exhibitions and performances have stopped? When in fact we have suppressed art, uh, not the making of art, but perhaps the business of art. Uh, so at one level, this response has been very pragmatic. It's just been, let's move everything online. Much of this uh, as virtual exhibitions, which in general are, are web pages with images, uh, some of it gallery installed work, some of it maybe just simply images set against a white page background, following the model and the template that we have of white cube gallery websites. 
Uh, and of course, the dream of online galleries that sell this whole, this whole idea of galleries as part of the online galleries as part of the commercial art world have been around for a long time, but they never really worked. Uh, a bit like online teaching, uh, and we've seen recently in the last couple of years, we've seen things like curated services, you know, art as a service, like sites like Neo and Data Editions. And then we've also seen which are, are selling art as a kind of a streaming service. Uh, and then we've seen commercial galleries like Gagosian and Zwerner have been launching these viewing rooms, uh, which have been expanded greatly in the last couple of, in the last month or so, uh, where, where they, they show particular works and, and have it set up as part of the commercial enterprise. Uh, so this is kind of the virtual gallery. Uh, this idea that's been universally seen as a poor substitute for the real thing, as, as, as something that we can fill in when we can't do the actual physical gallery. But as we move past this first wave of what has been a kind of an emergency response, I think things are gonna get more interesting in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is that as we're all living online more overtly than usual, or arguably that the, the internet has colonized the last few places of everyday life that it hasn't got to yet, then this very condition, the condition of being online constantly becomes a matter of interest in itself in a way that's inescapable. Uh, so in the crisis so far, we can see that the kind of the winners, the real winners have been Silicon Valley. Uh, and the Silicon Valley companies haven't, le haven't been letting a good crisis go to waste. Uh, so I suggest that the, with these conditions that the network itself has come more into view as a focus of inquiry, rather than receding into the background as ubiquitous technologies are supposed to do if we follow someone like Mark Weiser. And so this calls for this revisiting of the idea of the critical user versus the passive consumer model of internet use. Uh, and I think that the trend in the internet, uh, as the internet becomes more and more embedded in everyday life, uh, the trend has been for the user to become more and more a passive consumer of a product. Uh, the second point is that there is a return, or maybe a renewed interest in, net art. Uh, and of course, net art never went away. And, and what I mean by net art is that art that is natively online and R has a subject matter, the network in all its forms. Uh, so as already mentioned that, you know, institutions are commissioning online work, maybe not net art, but, but work that is, has to be delivered in some way online. Even the Arts Council, uh, which has been notoriously shy of anything digital, had, has a scheme now that requires an online presence. Uh, but what I think, and, and these, these have been, somewhat problematic in all sorts of different ways and there's been a kind of a reaction against them. But what I think is positive is that it has refocused attention on the internet as a medium and as a subject. Uh, and from my point of view as a teacher, as we head back into a new school year in art school, the virtual gallery paradigm I think is gonna get old very fast. Uh, students will start to engage with the internet in more interesting ways by default because they will be existing on it for, for so much of their time. Uh, so that's only not only rethinking making and how we ha making art and how we experience art and all of the networking and social aspects of the exhibition too, but also this critical relationship with our digital tools. Uh, so I would say that net art is back in, in a kind of a real uh, meaningful way, but the form is maybe not so not so clear. Uh, so maybe I, I'll start with a couple of things that won't be, or I'll finish with a couple of things that won't be. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a reboot of the 90s, of net art in, in that kind of uh, early phase, uh, despite the claims from artists who were active at the time. I think the conditions have changed too much for that. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a Post post internet art, if that makes sense, a, a kind of a reaction to this ubiquitous internet and a generation that has grown up never knowing outside of the internet. Uh, I think it's something that will exist outside of the locations of art and have to negotiate its own place in the world. 
Uh, and that's something that the 90s net art did so well, I feel. Uh, and finally, hopefully, I think it will be, uh, I hope it will be, to quote Dan Graham, something that's more social, more collaborative, and more real than art. Uh, and if I was to leave you with an example of that, I, I would say the recent exhibition, wellnow.wtf, is an exhibition that was, was got a lot of publicity, it was uh, curated by Faith Holland and Lorna Mills and Wade Wallerstein. Uh, and as an example of something that will point maybe to this kind of new interest in net art in a kind of a new form that responds to our situation uh, and also points towards different ways of understanding art. And uh, I will leave it at that, I think. Thanks, Connor. Um... Noel, if you just want to finish it up. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'd also like to thank Al and Dan for inviting me along to this panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, as you can see, I have a background which, in fact, Zoom has decided that's what my background is, and I've tried to change it, but I can't. So I think uh, what I'd like to do is maybe just talk about some of the general issues that I see. And this, these are, I suppose, aligned to some of the comments that have been made so far, uh, aligned to the notion of uh, performativity, aligned to translation or spatialization, translation from one medium to another. And some of the comments that uh, Connor made around the, maybe the becoming of the internet, becoming much more apparent and obvious, the network itself becoming much more obvious to us all, even as I sit here in front of a screen in uh, my office at home. Uh, so maybe to help that, what I was going to suggest, it's, it's interesting to think about or to reflect on what's, what's missing in this exchange that we're having here at the moment today. Uh, one thing that strikes me is there is a level of uh, interaction which is missing the kind of socio-pragmatic aspect, the eye contact, the body movement, the shifting in the chair, which is kind of signals to me that other members on the panel with me are agreeing, disagreeing, or about to intervene. The second thing uh, which is missing is perhaps a little bit more complex to explain. And this is something which could be termed the idiomatic or the idiosyncratic. So what I mean by that is that in the general understanding of computational standardization, for example, of language. The thing which language or the system finds very difficult to cope with is that thing which is the very foundation of meaning making itself, which is the ability to create uh, new meanings, new idioms. So the idiomatic is something I would see as something uh, crucial to our understanding of processes of computation. To set the other thing, that's missing is actually the very embodiment itself. So I think that goes back to some of the things we spoke about earlier on in terms of uh, our understanding of what the theatre is and our understanding of what performance is. But this is embodiment in the sense of locality also. So one way I, I, I am in, dislocated in this very conversation this afternoon because I am present and absent at the same time. So. The next aspect to that is a kind of is a phenomenological experience. So an experience of the world, which is based on my own embodiment in the world. And although, as Connor said, you know, this shift to online has been extraordinary, uh, the speed that it, it has taken place at in terms of within our context in TU Dublin, in terms of teaching and learning around fine art and, and the conservatory of music, for example, but what we see are also things which are missing. So the ability to use these types of technologies has been generalized to an extraordinary extent very quickly. And that's perhaps picks up on Connor's point around, you know, Silicon Valley doing very well out of this. But also there is a kind of generalization that this is something that, that works. This is something that we can easily translate music education or music performance. And this is, I think, where we rub up against the real difficulties with this. We have a kind of a techno solutionism, kind of an overgeneralization of technology. And in that overgeneralization, it's a form of technophilia that somehow this is 
a good thing that it can solve all the issues. So then to step back from that for a second, I think we have to have the notion of critique. I think Carl mentioned critical user. So here, what we can see is even as I speak to you now, my, I'm conscious that my email is pinging, that I have probably a number of Word documents open at the same time. I've got PDFs open. So in this interface with the computer, we have what Catherine Hales would refer to as inbuilt distractions. So there's an inbuilt distraction in the interface of the computer itself. So I'm constantly distracted. My attention is constantly dispersed across the different activities of the computer itself. So this is a form of inbuilt uh, distraction. The second thing that I would comment upon is what I, somebody referred to as my Zoom attentive face. So I spend so much time looking at myself on Zoom that I become aware of my attentiveness. So I have to perform a form of attentiveness. So my face is portraying a pretense of attention, which is perhaps not there. So there are kind of just some of the opening comments that I, I wanted to make. And perhaps in the q and I can develop this because there is a kind of more profound philosophical critique of technology behind some of the things that I've said. So thank you, Elle. All right, thanks. And if um, everyone could put your cameras on, please, as we shift into the panel discussion uh, part of this. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your thoughts. Uh, it's really great to hear about the different ways that you've been engaging with and thinking about the use of technology, especially with the um, transition to many things online. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you all together is because you have been all thinking about and using technologies in ways before this has happened. But even so, there has been the sense of pivoting. There is a transition here. And um, one of the points that I know I was thinking about as we've had to shift more online is many of these more, um, if you can think of a way as this kind of digital platform being more uh, marginalized or monetized where you know net art or digital art not treated as equivalent to what could be presented in a gallery, uh, live streaming as considered inadequate. And it does bring uh, points up as well, thinking about accessibility. So one of the uh, questions that came um, before the panel is thinking about how uh, those with venue access issues because of disability or other reasons are presently benefiting from all this online cultural activity. And uh, this has come about because now the needs of the many because of COVID-19, um, you know, we, we need this now, even able-bodied people. And so how can we think about where, you know, the needs of the few have always been there, uh, but what can we learn um, and I'm posing this to all of you, uh, after we you know in post COVID, if we can imagine such a state, how we can communicate, facilitate and work with all audiences and learn from these moments. So if someone wants to jump in. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point and, and really great development um, that it has shown that um, maybe the digital doesn't replace kind of um, venue based performances, but it can certainly augment and and maybe stand alone. If you if you understand the medium enough, it can it can stand alone as a kind of a, a another form of that performance um, and in so doing offer an experience to people that uh, maybe they couldn't access otherwise. But I would kind of say, like from my own work that um, and as Noel was kind of saying that there is kind of um, something within technology itself that if we're not very careful um, does really affect kind of the accessibility and that kind of goes beyond just affordability of devices which I think is one kind of aspect of it um, and also kind of the environmental impact of you know con consuming through these devices um, but I think like a what I work on a lot is um, mobile technologies that work with the body and, and sensor technologies that are kind of translating the body's um, data I suppose in back and how that is translated back into apps like step counters or jogging and and what that kind of tells us about the narratives that digital technology is starting to tell us about our own bodies and digital technology um, can sit sometimes too cozily in with kind of neoliberal consumer um, needs of kind of creating 
uh, tools that allow us to maybe control things like our bodies and that allow us to uh, have a very clear and what we think of as a very kind of simple um, interpretation of what our bodies are. And that in a way, because they allow very easily for things like quantification and comparison, um, they allow for, thing, for, for the idea of the average body or the normal body or the normal amount of steps that it takes, you know, or the normal amount of calories to become even more pervasive in how we think about what our bodies are and, and how they are. So I would say that there's a whole um, thing to be interrogated there about how de digital technology actually talks to us about our bodies and presents our bodies back to us and what as artists we can be doing to challenge what the dominant kind of narrative is uh, around that and how we can be using digital technologies to present experiences that really are truly accessible because they don't take any body to be normal they take everybody to be unique and to have different needs and different aspects of accessibility Leonie, do you um, want to talk a little bit about how working with these digital platforms, um, especially because you're, as you're showing us, your practice is very much involved with space as well. It's not just been about creating kind of, you know, white wall websites. Um, and if you want to relate this to these questions of accessibility or um, also thinking about the different opportunities that are coming up. Yeah, so one one thing that I've been thinking about um, is documentation and how the role of documentation has really shifted in terms of how we are documenting our events themselves. Um, for example, um, the big projection event, One Emerson, we live stream that on, on Facebook. I also um, myself personally did a watch party for that. And that first night we had over 12,000 people viewing live this this artwork of 18 minutes. And that's something that was so radically different. Um, and instead of just having, you know, an artist showcasing their work in the gallery setting, and maybe 2000 people watching it over the course of seven weeks of an artwork being up. Um, one additional thing that um, emerged in creating the virtual exhibition with the students is that we did zoom virtual studio visits with a number of the artists and then we recorded those and Zoom automatically creates this audio only file, which we then were able to incorporate as I think has Leonie frozen there? Okay. Um. Yeah, I think she's frozen there. So uh, yeah, we'll have to hopefully she'll okay. rejoin us. Okay. Um, this actually brings up another point I've been thinking about the material limitations of technology. I know I live in an area we actually had to install our own um, mobile receiver. Um, because we had to account for the material limitations of living in a part of Ireland, but they just don't have proper broadband. <laughs> and um, just thinking about those kinds of limitations, but I'm also relating to some of the points that you raised, Noel, about um, there are ways for us to interconnect, but it's, it's different. And just thinking about working in this context of the Zoom presentations, you know, we can look at each other, but it's, in, it's just looking through cameras. We can't read the audience. Uh, except for if someone puts something in the web chat. So just thinking about the translation and mistranslation um, of embodiment with digital technologies. Yeah, I suppose I could add something further to that. It's kind of the, what's missing is the embodied experience itself. And I think that's, you know, I don't think there's anything new when I say that, but I think what's become much more obvious to everybody is the, I think Connor pointed to it, is the, sometimes the limitations of, of this. I think that's always a challenge. I think that's a challenge to anybody to think about the limitations of, of what this actual exchange is. But I think in a wider context, it's also to do with the very materiality of, of this activity. That's what you pointed to, El. You know, now we have you know, a screen that freezes, the communication blocks, then we have to kind of set ourselves back up in terms of this 
co-enunciation now with Leone, so we have to build ourselves back up to where we are, where within that co-enunciation for us to create the meaning again. So I'm going to hand back to you, Leone. I kind of thank you. It was really quite perfect, actually, because the point that I was about to make was, you know, in regards to the conversation about accessibility, is that it's so easy for many of us to kind of assume that we all have equal access to digital devices, whether that's a laptop or a smartphone or even just really um, reliable internet connections. So whereas many people um, don't have access to any of those things. And I think that's really the big kind of dark side to even online learning and all of these cultural events switching to an online environment is that in some ways the access is actually um, much lessened and not equitable at all. So it was perfect that my own internet connection um, crashed at that moment. So. Uh, but I think on the, the other side of that is that there is also, and I kind of, this comes from my experience uh, when I started off making art uh, in net art that uh, suddenly I was able to access an audience that was not available to me locally I was able to, you know, participate in a kind of a community and make art that was not seen as being art really in, in the Irish context at that period of time. Uh, so even though we, we don't have the same access to physical locations, we also have to remember that those locations are, are, are only accessible to the people who are in the locality of them. Uh, so there is a kind of a, yeah, it's there, there's a reduced accessibility. You know, not everyone has the same access to the internet, but at the same time, a lot of people do, and more people have access to the internet, say, than they have access to, you know, New York City or you know Berlin or any of the other kind of art centers of of the world. Uh, so it's a kind of a, in some ways, the, the, there's ups and downs in this, and I, I think if we were to generalize, I would say that you know actually the internet is providing more access to more people than the concentration of, of art in, you know, particular locations where you can only fit so many people in an institution uh, and you have to be in that, in, in, in that country, in that city, in that location and be able to get to it. Uh, so in some ways there is, there's advantages to this, I think. And maybe that's just me thinking, thinking in a positive framework, uh, but for, yeah, I, I think there, 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 is, there is an upside to this as well. But at the same time, it, it has to be something that maybe looks at it as different to what the, what the physical experience is. It's not the same. It, doesn't, it can't be just ported from one thing to another and expected to have the same experience. As it needs something else. It needs to be actually uh, something that has considered, to be considered what is the, the nature of the medium, what is the change in this communication? There is a communication, but it's different to being in the room with someone. Uh, and I think that's, that's an interesting challenge for, for everyone who's, who's involved in, in making art or involved in teaching art to figure out, you know, how this is going to change. And it, it also speaks to things like climate change because, you know, if you're involved in, you know, academia and in the art world, there's an awful lot of travel, there's an awful lot of going, moving from place to place on airplanes. Uh, and we could kind of feel that that's coming to an end anyway. So maybe this has kind of uh, uh, shortened that, maybe sped it up a little bit as we have to rethink how we, how we do this thing of physical presence. Or even our conversation today is an example of something new where people can get together now and, and join in conversation that otherwise probably wouldn't have. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Just even the fact that you're able to join us, Leonie, from Boston, when that would be much more complicated if we had to have a physical panel. Um, but just thinking as well um, about how, and this draws on some of the points that were raised where, you know, as Connor had mentioned, where gallery spaces, you know, those are no longer the sites as we had known them and people are trying to transition online. But what is happening to, you know, this idea of the art store or the people, the kind of celebrity artists who had really been dominating the exhibition circuits? I'm also thinking about how the Venice Biennale has been pushed back a year. 
and it brings in questions when we think about, you know, when the internet was first coming about, this idea of this democratization in art, but we soon realized that that wasn't necessarily the case. But is, is there a moment here? Is there an opportunity here to kind of shift attention? Maybe this is the moment we missed out on before. If anyone wants to. Well, I, I'll take it up. I think, you know, the, the original enthusiasm around the use of internet technologies and deliberative platforms and soon was um, recuperated or enclosed in a certain way. And I think it's, it's now, as we come to this point, we see the limitations perhaps of, of what that enclosure was. And I think that's where we could be optimistic and say, well, this is a point of shift. You know, whether we think about the materiality of the internet, I think that's always, a, it's a difficult discussion because when we talk about, you know, the Anthropocene and academics and artists flying to Venice for the Biennale has a certain uh, imprint uh, on the planet, but also these digital platforms that we're using also have an imprint on the planet. So one of the things that I've been working on recently as part of a collective in Paris was around the notion of not just the Anthropocene, but the Anthropocene. So entropy as a dispersion of energy, which is thermodynamic, but also from information theory is about dispersion of information. And we also think maybe in terms of our own uh, set of biosphere, we could only think of our own intellectual new sphere has been impacted by the use of technology. So I think, you know, philosophically, we could think of this as a point where Stiegler uses the term pharmacology. So we could think of the toxic or the curative aspects of technology. And there are ways within technology to re-harness it for something which is outside of that enclosure outside of that constant extraction of monetary value. That's, that's what I would say. I think as well, from a, from a physical perspective, you know, we, we had a lot of feedback, especially over the, the beautiful weather for the interaction project. There were six artists presenting work. Um, some of them were online and some of them were offline. My work was an MP3 that you downloaded and you, took, you played as you went walking. Um, but some of the feedback that I had from people was like, I, I can't, you know, I, I couldn't do your piece because I just assumed it was online and I just was completely zoomed out. I think zoomed out is now a phrase that people are using. I, I just wonder how long can we sustain uh, looking at screens for a huge period of the day, every, every single day. And, you know, will that, will there be a, a kind of a point at which fatigue will set in and people will you know have to try and find alternatives or, or try and limit their screen time and and actually deliberately step away from the screen and, and maybe not therefore engage so much with you know the arts which you know if they have to engage after a whole day of work that they've done on screen and then they have to engage with the arts on screen as well you know is that a challenge as well in terms of kind of yeah just the physical the meeting of the human body with the the, the technology of the screen i think is, is going to be something that's very challenging for people yeah, I think you're right. And just from my own calendar perspective, I've noticed that it was very easy to very quickly fill up my calendar with digital events and all these different Zoom events. I could just be just as busy being at home as I previously would have been in real life. So. Yeah, and in even just thinking about with going to the Zoom, I mean, you're not committed to the same kind of time uh, calendar, um, especially in, when with childcare, with children at home, there is a capacity. But then thinking of the interruptions that happen online, there's also the interruptions of children running outside of the hall <laughs> and making sure they don't pop in. Um, so there is even this kind of context collapse that's happening within our homes where it's not just online. Um, but I just wanted to ask one more question before we go, and it emerges from some of the points Mairead had raised, but I think all of you, if you want to think about it, where even though we've been focusing on art in the context of digital technologies, what are the, some of the ways that we use art and technologies that can enable us to think about technologies differently in our everyday use, or perhaps think of them more critically or creatively?
Um, I can speak to my project just a, a little bit. Um, it's called Slow Down, You Move Too Fast. And it's basically a kind of an anti-jogging experience, anti-jogging app experience, where the idea is that instead of, uh, I suppose, the idea of being productive and using technology to measure uh, how productive we're being um, in terms of kind of how fast we're walking or how many calories we're burning or whatever, uh, it's actually about how slow can you walk. And if you slow down, how does that change your mental processes? How does that change your sense of interconnection with your environment? Um, so the idea that instead of, I suppose, the, the narrative around technology, which I think, again, is not, as Noel was kind of saying, it's not within the technology, it's actually within the structure that is using the technology at the moment, the, I would say, neoliberal consumerist kind of structure. Um, and, and that idea that it's kind of uh, pushing towards, you know, constant progression and obs obsolete kind of and, and pushing us forward to kind of a faster and faster pace. What actually happens if you if you challenge that use of technology and if you actually use technology to slow down and to step away and to enable kind of different processes that are then kind of um, structured through your body and through your sense of your own physical movement slowing down and your sense of your own thought processes hopefully slowing down. So I suppose it is a kind of a case of um, maybe understanding the kind of the wider philosophical and, and kind of interrogations around technology um, as, as well as just how they're being used kind of in a practical kind of sense, I think is what will allow artists to really harness them and question them and use them to make really interesting experiences that then allow us to kind of question how we, what we accept, the, the uses that we accept for technology and maybe the uses that we should ask more for. Yeah, and if I, if I can add to that, I, I agree with Marae's point. I think we've been through this period of intensification of, you know, how technology has been, you know, over so many aspects of our lives. Uh, with with a kind of an ever increasing pace and an ever increasing kind of uh, connection to us, where you know this this idea of the the constant Zoom calls uh, has already been there, with, with, which you know the, the constant checking of emails, or you know beyond beyond work times over weekends, because it's always it's always present, it's always ready to hand. And I think this kind of crisis, where this has kind of escalated to you know preposterous to group points to some 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 ways there's been so much of it that it's brought it to attention in a way that it was it was creeping before but now it's brought it to attention we can't ignore it and i think this is something and if we go into another year of this particularly kind of in a in a teaching environment if we go to another year of teaching like this it's completely unsustainable so i think is we're, we're going to have to consider you know the role the place of of uh, always on technologies in our lives and we're going to have to kind of you know place boundaries around them figure out what is and what isn't what what is and isn't uh, doable and, and i think you know one of the artistic was that there is a place for an artistic response to that to kind of highlight the you know how these technologies are encroaching how this kind of mission creep has been happening and I think the other interesting thing that's happened is that, you know, a lot of Silicon Valley companies have kind of shown their hands, uh, particularly notice that when Google brought out those location uh, uh, measurements where they showed you how, how many, uh, how less, how less people were leaving their homes uh, in the shutdown, how effective the shutdown was county by county. And for me, that was kind of a, a complete moment of, wow, they've actually shown how much they are tracking every single person in the country to what degree uh, as a kind of a, a way to, 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 you know, as a kind of a public service that showed just the extent of, you know, kind of always on surveillance of how, how, how extensive their system is, how extensive their information is, how much they are tracking people. And I think we've seen a lot of those things that, that, that I would say would cause people to question what's, what's happening. How did we get to this situation? How did it kind of suddenly sneak up on us? Uh, so in some ways, the crisis has shown us where we are. Uh, and I think that will cause, you know, I think we need to reflect on that. And I, I think artists are going to be part of that to reflect on how do we get here? And, you know, what can we do that's different?
we only so one, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. sure yeah one of the things that i've been thinking about is you know the different phases that we're going through kind of the initial phase of scrambling and crisis and translating things that were designed to be real live events and experiences and then translating them online in some way that either we're still comparing it to the original that it should have been to maybe now designing things specifically to be enjoyed experience digitally and online and then again this fall when the gallery may be open again you know how do i create hybrid models of experiences where we have a real live exhibit experience but then with limited physical access and then combining that with um, kind of new models of digital access and um, I'm hoping, I mean, it sounds challenging and daunting, but at the same time, also exciting. And, you know, perhaps like in the end, or if there's an end, but if there's, you know, an additional phase, like what could we retain from these new experiences and how can we perhaps then augment and make our future um, art experiences better than they would have been without kind of our crisis um, learning moments that we're all experiencing now. No, if you have anything you want to finish us off with. <laughs> or you're on mute. So if there's anything though, uh, well, I suppose I get like the, the opportunity is there, as I was saying, to think about technology in a new way. And I think it's always, as you, uh, I've worked with Connor and Elle in the past, it's always of interest to see that it's really the artistic expression that sometimes will enable us come to that understanding. So this idea that Leon points to different phases, I think is really important. So the first phase is always going to be the emergency phase and it's afterwards when it gets translated into different art forms, that's perhaps where the process of understanding of the emergency can begin to take place. And that's what I'd be hopeful for. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time and thank you to our 30, now 35 panel, our participants that can't see of the audience and out there in Facebook and Radio Land. So um, I found this quite enjoyable and it's really great to have conversations of this sort, even when we are apart. So I think we'll end with that.